Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Technology Officer RSA Zulfika Ramzan. Welcome to the RSA Conference 2018 Crypto Panel. This panel has been a long standing tradition and highlight of the conference. I know many of you are new this year, so for those of you who are new, I should warn you. The term crypto has undergone a bit of a metamorphosis recently. So if you are here to learn about the latest investment strategies for independent coin offerings, you are absolutely in the wrong place. But if you do want to learn about the past, present, and future of our industry, from the icons, the legends, whose scientific and technical contributions have ultimately brought all of us together, then look no further. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Professor Ron Rivest of MIT, the R in RSA. <laughs> Professor Adi Shamir of the Weizmann Institute, the S in RSA. <laughs> Whitfield Diffie from Cryptomatic, co-inventor of public key cryptography. <laughs> Paul Kotcher, security researcher, co-inventor of the SSL version three protocol and Moxie Marlinspike, last but not least, the founder of Signal. All good. Well, first of all, I want to start by congratulating our panel on a number of awards they've won over the course of the past year. And as I did this, there was a long list, so I'm going to try to keep it relatively brief. Uh, but to start with, Wit, I want to acknowledge that you were elected to the Royal Society this past year and inducted into the National Engineering Society as well. Uh, Paul, you were made a fellow of the International Association for Cryptologic Research. Uh, Moxie, you were a recipient of the Levchin Prize. Uh, Adi and Ron, you together with Shafi Goldwasser and Silvio Mikali were recipients of the Frontier of Knowledge Award and also were inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame together with Len Edelman. So please congratulate the panel on some very, very well-deserved accolades. So I want to begin by asking each of you to give me some interesting highlight or something that might be top of mind from the past year. I guess I'll begin. Uh, it's been an interesting year. Uh, for me, with my interest in elections, uh, this has been a very interesting year. We're seeing a lot more focus on the security of elections. Elections are central to our democracy. The fact that the Department of Homeland Security designated elections, elections as critical infrastructure is very important. So that's number one on my list, certainly top of mind. The other thing that uh, I found very exciting this year was the Spectre meltdown attacks, and we'll let Paul say more about that later, but I, those two were the top of my mind. Time to think about what's uh, top of my head. I would say that uh, as an academic, I'm bothered by the lack of preciseness in cybersecurity research. If you look at cryptography and uh, literature, uh, academic literature on cryptography, we have precise definitions, uh, we have proofs, of theorems. If you look at uh, cybersecurity, everything is mushy. Uh, there aren't exact uh, uh, definitions. Um, certainly, there are no theorems and proofs. Uh, I've been trying to think during the year about how to try to make uh, uh, cybersecurity quantitative rather than qualitative. And uh, I think it's time we make this move. Well, I'd like to remember two people who died last year. Both of them important to this community, and I think neither of them known to most of you. First is my wife, Mary Fisher. She died a few weeks after the conference last year. She called herself the elder mother of public key cryptography, and I would not have accomplished any of what I've done without her. I'm sorry to cry through this one. Um, <laughs> You know, people frequently tell you how much they owe their partners for the emotional support they got. And unquestionably, I liked Mary's irrational enthusiasm for my work uh, tremendously. But Mary gave me something else, because almost everybody in the world loved Mary. I wasn't the only one. And that opened doors for me everywhere. 
I don't think, for example, that my relationship with Marty would have gone the same without Marty and his wife's fondness for Mary. So um, that event, of course, dominated last year for me. But also last year, a man 20 years older, uh, Malin Doyle, who was the most influential cryptographic designer at RSA died. Uh, Malin started out as a technician. He worked on a machine called Sig Sally, uh, which is the first secure device, voice device, and some of you may have heard me discuss it. It's, a, it's pivotal in the development of cryptography. Uh, it's awfully like a modern phone, except that it uh, occupies a, a room half the size with seven-foot-tall racks of equipment. And he went on, he joined Armed Forces uh, Security Association and worked on the KI-1, which is a more realistic successor to, uh, to Sig Sally. And then he designed the crypto system for the KY-3, which actually was in use then for some 20 or 30 years, was the backbone of a system called AutoCivocom. He went on to design a machine called the KG-30, known to those of you who know it probably as the KG-34, the full duplex version, last of the great, quote, long cycle encryptors. He, and a few years ago, I told you I would tell you what somebody did um, uh, when, when somebody else died. Well, somebody else was Malin, and Malin was one of two designers of the most famous, I think, name in secret algorithms, Savile. Uh, and then finally, in, when DES was released, um, a man named Howard Rosenblum had a lot of role in that project. And he wanted, quote, a military encryption standard. So he called on Malin to design that, and it, ultimately appeared under the name Phalanx and was used in, it's been replaced now, but it was used in secure network projects. And finally, Malin trained some of the people who developed the current military cryptographic techniques. So nobody else, I think nobody from the inside world parallels that. I think Ron maybe parallels it and, got a collection of four widely used algorithms, but uh, Malin was incredible. Thank you. A lot of what I've been looking at over the past year involves trying to understand performance security trade-offs. And there's been this idea in the technology industry that we can have this kind of Goldilocks solution where we can have speed and safety at the same time and I'm getting more pessimistic about that perspective. Um, if I look at <laughs> processors, I look at operating systems, I look at compilers, development methodologies, these things have all been optimized over the past 50 years to be as fast as possible with security as a really a secondary objective. And I think we have to go back and revisit a lot of these choices we've made. And also there's a cultural shift that I've been looking to try to figure out how to create which is that the leadership and the technology industry all made our careers in an era where all of the value gains came from being faster and everything else was secondary. But now the uh, economic importance of the issues has shifted. Security is a trillion or multi-trillion dollar problem. The value we get from performance gains is a rounding error compared to that. So we really have to completely change the way that we look at technology and try to figure out how as an industry we can do that. Um, I think really the most notable thing for, for me in the past year uh, has been the substantial shift in the general perception of uh, social technology. I think that um, the utopian narratives of connecting the world and organizing the world's information are coming to an end and that really um, sort of surprisingly across all demographics, across really the entire political spectrum, um, people um, are seeing social technology less as like a hopeful tool for a better, brighter tomorrow and um, more as like weapons that everyone simultaneously seems to think are in the wrong hands. Uh, and I, I think that that's a really interesting development uh, for society, but I also think it has uh, direct consequences for uh, what everyone is doing here and uh, what all the work that people are doing in the, in the field of privacy and um, cryptography. Fantastic. 
So I know this past year, as I mentioned in the opening remarks, the term crypto has been somewhat usurped by uh, these digital currencies like Bitcoin. We have 50,000 people at this year's conference. I want to give the panel an opportunity to set the record straight and to help reclaim our heritage. So this is uh, really a big problem. Uh, but uh, I came up with a great way how to avoid the confusion. Um, if uh, we insist... With a K. Sorry? Spell one with a C and one with a K. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> you just stole my joke. <laughs> <laughs> we should pronounce it differently. Uh, what we are doing is crypto and what they are doing is crypto. <laughs> The crypt, no, we should keep the crypto from cryptography for computer security, and they can have the crypto from cryptosporidium. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think we really ought to reclaim the term uh, crypto for cryptographers and, and something else for the currency thing. I don't know what the term should be, but uh, maybe we should get a petition going here. <laughs> cryptography for the cryptographers. That's right. There you go. You heard it for the first time. Tweet it out. <laughs> but it is surprising. I mean, the amount of hashing that's done for the cryptocurrencies, I think it's like 2 to the 64th hashes a second probably totally swamps the amount that's actually done for real security purposes. It's amazing. Maybe there's some business model you can develop around that somehow. Yeah, yeah but we'll, in the discussions, we learned about this thing that doubles as a room heater mining <laughs> Bitcoin. I just think that's a great idea. We find the right distributed computations. We can amortize the cost into, uh, into heating. And yeah. I love it. <laughs> The, the next million dollar idea, space heaters based on cryptocurrencies. Yeah, you heard it here first. <laughs> so the second question I have is kind of building on, on Bitcoin. Obviously, there's this notion of blockchain that's become popular independently of Bitcoin. Do you think it's real? Is it snake oil? Can you implement it in some more easy way? What's your perspective on this topic? Maybe I can start with that. So, so blockchains are often viewed as sort of security pixie dust. Any, any application you have uh, will be made better and more secure by applying blockchains. But blockchains are, are very interesting beasts. They have certain properties that may or may not fit your security application. The properties they have that are interesting are that they're decentralized, they're public access, and they're immutable. So those, those are three interesting properties, but they, they fail sort of miserably in terms of scalability, throughput, and latency. And for certain applications like voting, they're very a, a poor fit. In many applications, they're just sort of a bad database choice. Um, for voting, they're particularly bad because you've got the secret ballot uh, you've got the need to, I mean, voting in any way is centralized, so the idea of a decentralized approach for voting doesn't, doesn't fit well. Um, but then the, the uh, casting your ballot, you want to make sure the voters have the ability to know that their vote was recorded properly. And an electronic database like the blockchain doesn't really work unless you've got some way that the voters can really verify that their vote was recorded properly. It doesn't matter if it's immutable, if it's wrong. Right? So I, I think that sticking with paper ballots uh, is a better choice for voting. Blockchains may fit for some applications, but uh, you know, they have limited security properties that may or may not fit what you need. I think that uh, blockchain is hugely overhyped, but uh, there are some real applications. One of them, uh, and here I want to tie it with the post-quantum uh, world, uh, might be to ensure the long-term security of digital signatures. Because uh, there is a possibility, and we'll dis probably discuss later uh, how real it is, that quantum computers uh, will be available in 20, 30 years. And some signatures have to remain valid for 50 years. If you sign a will or you uh, buy a house, etc. So one way how to use a blockchain in order to uh, guarantee the long, very long-term security of digital signatures is simply to prove that the signature was generated today before quantum computers are available. And uh, with this additional uh, piece of proof, it doesn't matter if in 20 or 30 years uh, a, a new uh, technology comes, you show that the signature is valid because it was generated at an early point in time. Hmm. I mean, it's related to if you, if you, right, keys are the epitome of something, which is if you depend on secrets, then you have a vulnerability because if the secrets leak, something fails. And so these various kinds of tree signatures and things that underlie blockchains seem to me a very valuable idea because whenever you don't have to have secrets, you shouldn't. This thing, though, where the public periodically discovers some crypto function and gets really excited about it. I mean, we saw this happen with symmetric algorithms. We saw it happen with public key and digital signatures. I forget there was cryptolopes at one point. 
Um, there was a company called Surety from, I think, 1994, uh, Stuart Haber and Scott Stornetta. It never made any money, so far as I can tell, but they um, built a system that has a lot of the properties of the current blockchains, um, and it never took off commercially, but while they're an interesting tool, I think I agree with the other panelists, it's not a business, it's just an interesting thing you can use when you're building a system like a log management tool. It should have done an ICO. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree with Ron, I feel like. Um, the, the primary value that blockchains provide is their distributed nature, and uh, the problem is that there aren't that many applications where uh, distributed is a super valuable property, and in particular, the entire consumer space uh, sees it as basically zero value. Um, and the other problem is the distributed systems generally don't work. Uh, they haven't <laughs> been working for a really long time. Uh, and uh, you know, I think the really all the blockchain stuff kind of reminds me of the P2P craze in the early 2000s, um, which was really similar. There was a lot of people with a lot of enthusiasm and uh, a lot of like ideas of you know how great things could be in the future, but not very sound engineering principles. So Adi, you mentioned uh, quantum computing. You just came back from the NIST workshop on post-quantum computers or post-quantum cryptography. Uh, do you think there's any quantum leap on the horizon in this space, or, or what's your perspective? So there was an interesting uh, technical talk by uh, uh, one of the leaders of the Microsoft effort. And uh, I listened very carefully to what he said. He didn't uh, give his own prediction. He gave the prediction of his boss the vice president uh, of Microsoft, uh, who uh, claimed that they'll have their first qubit by the end of this year, and they'll have a quantum computer using their unique technology uh, with topological qubits uh, in five years. But uh, he was very careful to distance himself from this prediction. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the proposals uh, that in the uh, workshop that was organized by NIST, um, initially there were 82 proposals, and uh, um, about uh, 64 remain today after some of them were withdrawn or uh, were deemed to be inappropriate. And uh, this is uh, too large uh, a number. I don't think that our community can spread itself so thin, uh, analyzing 64 proposals. Out of those 64, um, there are three main uh, uh, groups. Uh, there are about 26 proposals out of the 64, which uh, are uh, based on uh, lattice, lattice theory. Uh, there are 19 proposals based on coding theory. There are nine proposals based on uh, multivariate cryptography. And there are um, three proposals based on uh, hash-based uh, uh, techniques, Merkel trees. So altogether, I think that uh, the main contribution of the workshop was that all those schemes had to be uh, nailed down in terms of exactly how you choose the lattice, how you choose the um, error vector to add to your uh, lattice point. Everything had to be fully specified. And once you specified it, I was very pleasantly surprised by the speeds you could get. Most schemes uh, operated in a few milliseconds, and some of them uh, hundreds of microseconds. So speed-wise, most of the proposals, serious proposals, were uh, very reasonable. In terms of key sizes uh, and the uh, signature or ciphertext sizes, it was uh, around uh, between 1 and 10 kilobytes, typically. Something which is a bit unpleasant, but uh, you can live with. So altogether, we have a very interesting uh, uh, group of algorithms to dig our nails into and study. Hmm. So Adi, following up on your earlier yes. remarks, how many of the proposals came with proofs of security reductions from some assumed? <laughs> well, uh, many of them had reductions uh, to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I'm exaggerating, but um, uh, the proofs were fairly weak. Um, some of them had proofs in them, mostly in the uh, uh, case of the uh, lattices. Uh, there is the old result showing that average case and worst case are equivalent. Uh, but um, I think that uh, uh, NIST is going to have a very hard time uh, choosing in, within three years, which is uh, their uh, uh, professed timetable, uh, a winner among the new ideas. Uh, I think that they will be forced to use some of the uh, old and time-tested ideas which had been floating around. If you look at how long it took uh, for RSA to be accepted, widely accepted, 
took about 15 years, from 77 until the early 90s. If you look at public key crypto, uh, if you look at the uh, elliptic curve cryptography, it also took about uh, 15 years uh, from uh, 85 until uh, the early 2000s. So I think that uh, before, um, public key crypto systems are very hard to design and very tricky. And before uh, uh, they have been analyzed for 15 years, um, if I were in these shoes, I'd be very worried uh, about choosing them. But fortunately, there is one suggestion which had been time tested. This was the first proposal that was actually uh, described in the workshop, and it's called post quantum RSA. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when NSA put out some politic memo three years ago, the one action it took was an interim action of proposing 3,000 bit RSA instead of two. Now, if you're going to go that, if that direction will solve the problem, you're talking about keys of one to 10 kilobytes. You can do no, a 10. I'm the, sorry, I thought you said that. What the those no, the, the post quantum RSA had several tens of gigabytes of key size. Not, okay, <laughs> not what I was talking about. You talked about the other systems yes. having one to 10. Right, right? that's the lattices. A 10 kilobyte RSA, if, if that direction will solve the problem, that's the easiest way to go. Yes, but there is a difference, because in the others, you needed the 1 to 10 kilobytes in order to get something which doesn't have a polynomial time okay. attack on it. Uh, RSA with uh, 10,000 kilobytes is still going to have polynomial, but unpleasant polynomial, especially when you look at how many qubits you need. So there, there are technical differences there. You know, as we look, about, look for old algorithms that have quantum resistance, we shouldn't omit looking at hash-based signatures as well. Those are very, very well understood technology, very, based on very old um, techniques, work very, very well. So people should be using those a lot more if they need digital signatures that are quantum resistant. Obviously, for key agreement, we need these new so, standards. So my guess is that uh, NIST uh, will actually choose one of the, uh, uh, the hash-based schemes because they have been analyzed for a very, lo very long time. And another proposal uh, is uh, McLeese. Mm -hmm. uh, which had been around since 78, and very little progress had been done on uh, cryptanalyzing it. The other news maybe on the quantum front is that there's only been incremental progress on quantum computers. <laughs> so there haven't been any surprises there. I think there's a team in Austria that has a 20 qubit system, and Google's talking about their bristle cone chip with 72 qubits, I think. But yeah. um, I, I think we'll see. That a surprise. No surprises, exactly. I, I, I oh, consider that a surprise. You do? Oh, yes. Well, I just we'll see the it, progress would be slower. I, mean, I think we'll see quantum supremacy occur soon, where somebody can solve cr um, artificial problems using a quantum computer faster than a regular computer. But we're still a very long way from something that will break standard widely used cryptography. Um, but some of the proposals, like the uh, 49 uh, qubits and 50 qubits uh, that were announced last year, I've been following very carefully whether um, any good use was made of uh, those uh, additional qubits. And I haven't seen a single uh, uh, news article showing that uh, this jump in the uh, number of qubits had helped any um, particular goal. That, that's the challenge for, for these guys, building quantum computers, to show that it's useful for something besides breaking right. RSA. <laughs> <laughs> I would be willing to accept any kind of improvement in any area, but there was none. After the announcement of, uh, you know, we now have much larger uh, number of qubits, silence. Maybe the best application is stealing all of Satoshi's Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So kind of moving on to, uh, you know, we've talked about trying to break crypto using quantum. There's also the other fundamental element. Can you look at systems level security and find ways to bypass security mechanisms? So Paul, you were involved in the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerability discovery. Can you walk us through what that discovery was like and, and what happened from that point onward? Sure, so I was really involved with the Spectre side and just on, the, on sort of a tangential role with Meltdown. And um, I was actually at a conference with Mike Hamburg, who's one of the researchers from Cryptography Research, Rambus, that I've worked with for many years. And he's mentioning this speculative execution thing. What do you think about it? And it just gave me a bad feeling that processors were off making errors and then trying to bury them, because I've spent you know, hours in the lab trying to make processors make mistakes. And uh, I actually went through my, my old scraps of paper, I actually found, I was in a kind of a boring conference session, I won't say whose it was, and you know, wrote down on a piece of paper the code that actually exploits Spectre and then typed it into a computer. 
wrote a paper, notified Intel, found out that Google had found the same problem, but from a completely different angle. They um, had a researcher there, Jan Horn, who was looking at what was actually in the caches of computers and really deep in the hardware and noticed there were interesting things going on there. So we had this independent discovery of a problem that's been sitting around you know, completely in the open. You read a textbook on how to make a fast processor, and it tells you how to make a vulnerable fast processor. Um, but the, just from two dire different directions, within a few months, it was found twice. A um, bunch of sort of difficult challenges, though. I mean, the, the embargo process for hardware bugs is something we don't know how to do. With software, there's kind of this idea you wait a few months, and then you disclose it after you tell the party who can fix it. But who can fix a hardware problem in ARM processors, where the design goes from ARM to hundreds of chip makers to thousands of device makers? Um, who should know about a vulnerability in Intel processors when you've got Intel and then cloud providers and customers using them? I mean, I've got a huge number of emails from people who are unhappy that I didn't tell them. But both with that vulnerability embargo, as well as the one that I went through with differential power analysis, um, through the process, more people were told than could keep a secret. And in both cases, press leaks ultimately ended up in a sort of panicked end to the embargo. So in the case of DPA, there was a reporter in Australia who started writing about it. In this case, um, there were a bunch of press reports that were coming around. You don't want to be in a situation where the attackers have enough information to mount attacks and the defenders don't know what's going on. So in, in both cases, this decision was made to release the embargo early. So I don't know what to do in that kind of situation, having basically failed twice with that kind of embargo. And I, I think we need some ethicists and people thinking about what to, hand, what to do in those situations now, because there's going to be more of these things. There are a lot of problems we have in systems that can't be updated or easily. And as more of these vulnerability comes, vulnerabilities come out, we need a roadmap of what to do. You mentioned how difficult it is uh, to fix. And indeed, uh, there were patches and patches of patches and several generations. But I'm worried that uh, we'll get to the point at which billions of uh, microprocessors are going to be bricked. And uh, this will become uh, irreversible. If uh, uh, you have a problem like this in the software, usually reinstall the operating system and uh, uh, everything is OK. But if you play with the microcode on the, uh, uh, on the microprocessor, uh, there is a real possibility that uh, there will be a huge disaster. Well, we have still a pretty big mess. I mean, the companies that make processors have been talking about the sort of partial mitigations that are out there. But right now, a lot of the guidance involves putting these magic LFENs or CSDB instructions on all of the vulnerable paths of your code. But they're really slow, so people can't put them everywhere. And the tools for doing this don't exist. So there's a pretty large amount of work to be done still. That said, in terms of looking at the risk in context, I mean, we have this giant problem with software bugs. And well, hardware bugs, like this particular hardware bug is interesting from a computer science perspective in terms of the aggregate change in the risk posture of the industry. It's not a, you know, don't go running for the hills because of this. You maybe should be running for the hills for other reasons. Um, but this isn't the one that, you know, makes, you know, took our perfectly great computer systems and, and ruined them. So Paul, some the fundamental problem seems to be that you've got shared resources with, with adversarial and good guy right. programs on them both. And there's leakage, and it's hard to avoid the leakage with the complexity of the hardware we've got. Yes. I mean, if we can take advantage of Moore's law and have totally separate resources for the good guys and yeah. the bad guys. The cost of competing has gone down about a million over the yes, time so, of so, our so. careers. I don't know how much you that helps. I mean, you've got JavaScript running on, on code that the good guys want to run. And, I mean, and you don't that. design a processor for doing wire transfers in the same way you make one that's great for built playing video games. Yeah. The same for operating systems. And we have to start bifurcating our systems and customizing them for Security. We've done it for power already. I mean, ARM has this strategy they call Big Little, where there's the big fast processor and the little one that saves power for doing sort of other things. And we have to be building systems with security as the primary design objective, not a afterthought. Fantastic. So kind of switching topics a little bit, in late February it was announced that Apple had started hosting iCloud data for its Chinese users in China. And as part of that transition, the cryptographic keys that protect that data are also going to be hosted in China. Now, what do you think this might imply for things like exceptional access, and what do you think the broader implications might be? Once everyone has access, it's not exceptional anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I go from exceptional to routine very quickly, yeah. And I think the leadership in China is in for a surprise when their data gets hacked, because you allow this kind of wide access to information, and it's extremely dangerous, and we don't know 
as technologists how to build systems that can magically let the good guys break them and the bad guys stay out. So it's not going to end well. I think for China. Yeah, I think the Europeans are also maybe ahead of the game here. There was just a report that came out um, from the European Commission talking about data privacy, and, and they came out very strongly in, in favor of strong encryption, saying that backdoors and master keys are, are bad for encryption because of security reasons, not privacy. It's really a security argument that's being made here, not a privacy argument. And they say that backdoors and, and master keys are just not the way to go, that law enforcement has other ways of getting the information they need, and that that's what they should be doing. So that was, just came out this past few days. Fantastic. I think it's the same old story of uh, it's easier to say um, I can't than I won't. And uh, you know, if you put yourself in a position of being able to, uh, it's hard to resist. Absolutely. Do you think there's any broader implications around the world beyond just China? Well, it's interesting to see what will happen in the US. We still have this debate going on strongly in the US. The FBI is, continues to argue that they need access to phones and so on, too, that are decrypted. On the other hand, uh, the, the uh, number of people in Congress are accusing the FBI of saying, you know, you guys didn't really try very hard, did you, to get into the San Bernardino phone? No, you had the mechanism. You had third parties that can now do there this. There's the gray books. The, the, gray, the gray shift is like now, and then even back then, Celebrite had a technology, in, which right. they eventually used. I mean, this so, idea that if you suck up all the, world, all the data in, a, in an environment, you can make some interesting analytics with it. Is something that we see happen in corporate environments as well, where there are lots of tools that are designed to go and sort of snarf everything and give you some insights. But we need to recognize that these kinds of processes where you stick all your data in one place also create some risks. And those tools themselves are certainly a very juicy target for attacks. When you do it at a corporate level, though, it's pretty easy to understand what the trade-offs are. When you start doing it at a nation level or a global level, it's, it's really quite frightening. There was interesting development in Russia. About a month ago, the Supreme Court of Russia uh, decided that uh, Telegram should give their keys to the Russian government. And when they refused last week, the Russian government said that uh, Telegram uh, had become illegal to use within Russia. In Iran, um, Telegram had become illegal sometime earlier. So many countries are starting to uh, uh, legislate against uh, schemes uh, which, uh, for which they don't have the master key. But, and this is, I, to me, this is the same problem of like, uh, you know, Telegram has the plain text message history of every message you've ever sent or received, and uh, it's very difficult for them to refuse to provide that to a government. Uh, if, they, if that were all encrypted to begin with, it would be much easier for them to say, I can't. I can't is always easier than I won't. Yeah, and of course, if somebody has a lot of data on you, they can vacuum that data or snarf it and derive interesting insights, just like Cambridge Analytica did recently with all this Facebook data. Does the panel have a perspective on that, that particular issue? And could anything have been done to prevent that or mitigate the risk of it? I think there are lots of things Facebook could have done, but it wasn't in their interest to protect our data. And when we talk about risk in computer systems, part of the challenge is that the entities that determine what risks we incur are not us. And so uh, somebody who's choosing my risk for me may not make the decisions that I would. And in this case, Facebook made a series of decisions that benefited them but hurt their users. And while there are technologies Facebook could have deployed, it wasn't in their interest to go build a system that was resistant to this kind of thing. In fact, it's very much in their interest to take advantage of all the data they can collect. So I think we can't look to the companies that benefit from the status quo to solve these problems. So it all comes down to economics, right? The reason yeah. we don't build secure processors is if you use the gates some other way, you can make a little more money. And if you, the reason you, know, don't, you don't have secure databases of people is because then nobody can make as much money off of them. But, I mean, but Bain just put out a, a report describing the cost of insecurity and it's, it, their conclusions, depending on what inputs go in, measure in the many uh, trillions of dollars. So the, the cost of society, but is it the cost of the individual entrepreneurs? Exactly. Externalizing cost is a lot of the secret of success. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I, the, the Facebook thing is super interesting to me for that reason. I feel like in many ways, Facebook is like the Exxon of our time. Uh, you know, that um, it's this uh, in, indispensable tool that's a daily part of everyone's life that everyone despises. Uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of brands like that. You know, Exxon, Comcast, maybe. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, I mean, the interesting thing is that it's like, 
you know, as much as everyone hates Exxon, um, it doesn't matter, you know, how many gallons of oil Exxon dumps into the ocean or how egregious Facebook's privacy violations are, because to most people, Exxon is civilization and Facebook is the internet. And, but I think, you know, that like externalizing thing, you know, for a long time, people were optimistic about Exxon too, the whole oil industry, you know, the, the, the future that it was going to bring us to. And after enough oil spills and enough climate change, people thought, oh, maybe we should invest in battery technology, you know? <laughs> And I, I think, you know, Facebook is going through that moment now, you know, like they're dealing with the metaphorical camera that's underwater in the Gulf, just showing the oil spewing into the, uh, into the Gulf, you know, their, their crude oil floating uh, in the ocean. And, you know, I think, you know, we're the people who are looking around thinking, huh, oh, maybe we should invest in battery technology. Yeah. Talking about privacy, there is huge development in Europe, uh, and this is uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, uh, Regulations. And um, I think that that is going to have huge effect, uh, partly because the penalties for not complying are uh, very severe. Uh, a company can be fined with 4% of its uh, worldwide turnover for violating any of the provisions which are fairly unclear in uh, many uh, areas. So uh, if I want to be cynical, I would say this is just uh, plan B of European governments, how to tax big American companies. They couldn't get the 4% uh, one way, so they are going to get it the other way. But uh, in reality, uh, there are some uh, very interesting proposals there. They deal with issues of uh, uh, access for uh, uh, public security and the national intelligence uh, uh, reasons. So they are covering many bases, and I highly recommend that people uh, look into GDPR because it can really affect your companies. There are, there are several talks here in the conference on GDPR, yes. which is, should be well worth hearing. But I think GDPR could have the effect of entrenching Facebook's monopoly, right? Because GDPR is largely about consent, that you like consent to this thing. And that's bad for small ad networks that are tracking you around the network, or around the internet that compete with Facebook. But it's good for Facebook because, you know, they can refuse service if you don't consent. And again, you know, for most people, Facebook is the internet. Uh, so I don't... I don't, and, uh, so I don't know if uh, that's going to like really fix the problems that we have. But it goes far beyond consent. So there are issues of uh, privacy by design, privacy by default, the ability uh, to be forgotten, uh, to delete uh, data about yourself. So mandatory use of encryption too? Yes. yes yeah. So I guess we're running to the last question of the panel. I want to ask each of you. Uh, this morning's keynote talked about the notion of silver linings among the many clouds that we have to deal with in cybersecurity. Uh, what silver linings, if any, do you see? And uh, what hope do you have for the audience? That's a tough question. I mean, <laughs> we, we live in an era when, when we feel that the, the attackers are winning often. And uh, I know the talk this morning uh, was, up, was upbeat uh, by, by the head of RSA. But, uh, you know, I think we have, uh, you know, the lessons, the silver linings we're getting are Often, you know, where are the attackers going to focus? What, what are they looking at? What, what, what systems do we need to defend? For me, I'm very pleased to see the in increased focus on election security, uh, that we need to make our elections more secure. We now have uh, two-thirds of voters voting on paper ballots. We're paying much more attention to cybersecurity and all these systems. That's, in some sense, a silver lining, but it's a silver sil lining we're learning the hard way. I listened very carefully to this morning's uh, first keynote in which uh, Rohit uh, said that one of the silver linings is that we are moving at higher velocity. But velocity is a vector, and he forgot to say whether we are moving forward <laughs> or backward <laughs> at higher speed. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, if you want a silver lining, uh, actually, I think that uh, it is the fact that our job security is guaranteed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our services time. will be needed for security. a very long time. I just echo that. I mean, you guys are all, you know, security investors, security in engineers. You have a good security isn't solved. You don't have to find a new job. Well, I think we all like music, but if you're in the Titanic, hearing the band playing is kind of a small silver lining. Um, <laughs> well, that said, that though, I, mean, I think there are some ways we can reduce the size of the battlefront that we're fight facing. And as complexity increases, if we keep fighting a battle where our the complexity of the battlefront grows exponentially, we're going to lose. And risk management isn't actually always a silver bullet there, but I think better hardware is something that people are putting a lot more resources yeah. into. And I'm optimistic that we can start getting some components where 
the probability of failure is low. We've had that with crypto for a while. The chance that AES 256 will get broken in the next year is almost negligibly small in terms of a practical attack. We need to have more things than just the crypto algorithms that have this high probability of being robust. Yeah, but it's crypto mathematics that goes straight downhill, right? The implementations of the algorithms, uh, flaky, you know, the software, all the rest of it. But you can make a chip that does crypto with a yeah, low chance of being buggy. It's when you stick it all on top of a really complicated no, operating it's, system it's, on it's, an Intel it's processor devoting, with it's whatever, devoting it's devoting enough hardware to adequate isolation Right. That is the straightforward thing to do. And wasting That's a penny worth of hardware for security instead right. of just sticking it all in the same place, yeah. But that chip would be made in China and... Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, if I were forced to be optimistic, uh, <laughs> I would say that to me it's feeling more like uh, privacy and cryptography technology are less about protecting the little shards of information that we have left to ourselves and more like we're actually building the infrastructure for the world that we want. Outstanding. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for an outstanding panel. Please join me in thanking our amazing panelists. <laughs>